more war if every man in the world had his mind set on freedom if every brother stood with brother as a witness for peace if every man of every nation young and old this generation held his hands out in the name of love there would be no more war if every leader in the world shared a true course for freedom if every nation raised this world a sweet dream of peace if every leader of every nation who worked for justice and liberation holding hands out in the name of love there would be no more war if every nation in the world set a true course for freedom if every nation raised its children in the culture of peace if all our sons and all our daughters reached in friendship across the water refusing to be enemies there would be no more war good morning welcome I'm Reverend Kalani Kuchela. Our opening words are from the Unitarian minister, the Reverend William Ellery Channing. The writing is called The Free Mind. I'll be joined by Reverend Dana Lightsey, who will read this responsive reading with me. I call that mind free, which masters the senses and which recognizes its own reality and greatness which passes life, not in asking what it shall eat or drink, but in hungering, thirsting, and seeking after righteousness. I call that mind free, which jealously guards its intellectual rights and powers, which does not content itself with passive or hereditary faith. Which opens itself to light, whensoever it may come, which receives new truth as an angel from heaven. I call that mind free, which is not passively framed by outward circumstances and is not the creature of accidental impulse. Which discovers everywhere the radiant signatures of the infinite spirit and in them finding helps to, finds help to its own spiritual enlargement. I call that mind free, which protects itself against the usurpations of society and which does not cower to human opinion. Which refuses to be the slave or tool of the many or of the few and guards its empire over itself as nobler than the empire of the world. I call that mind free which resists the bondage of habit, which does not mechanically copy the past nor live on its old virtues but which listens for new and higher monitions of conscience and rejoices to pour itself forth in fresh and higher exertions. I call that mind free which sets no bounds to his love, which wherever they are seen delights in virtue and sympathizes with suffering. Which recognizes in all human beings the image of God and the rights of God's children and offers itself up a willing sacrifice to the human cause. I call that mind free, which has cast off all fear, but that of wrongdoing and which no menace or peril can enthrall. Which is calm in the midst of tumults and possesses itself through though all else may be lost. My name is Steve Todd. I'm the worship assistant for 
the UU Church of Boulder this morning, and what a joy it is to see so many smiling faces from the Western United States and beyond. In lighting our chalice this morning, I use these words from Molly Brewer entitled, When Things Aren't Okay. My beloved people, I cannot pretend, and so I will not tell you that everything is okay right now. There is no reason to be angry that you must be optimistic or at peace. I cannot pretend these things, so I won't tell them to you. But now as our chalice is lit, I ask in this moment that we, re re that we remember these words from Rebecca Parker. There is a love. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all. By the light of our chalice, let us rest in this love. We also have these chalice lighting words. They're actually four quotes from Frederick Douglass, the great African-American abolitionist. The white man's happiness cannot be purchased by the black man's misery. I don't know, I didn't know I was a slave until I found out I couldn't do the things I wanted. <clears throat> no man can put a chain around the ankle of his fellow man without at last finding the other and fastened to his own neck. What is the slave? What to the slave is the 4th of July? We light our chalice this morning in the name of freedom and all things free, including this free faith of Unitarian Universalism. Amen, John and Stephen. This morning, we want to take a few moments for a flower memorial for our beloved Diane Taylor. I will share with the congregation from Boulder and all our visitors that when we have a member who dies, we try to have this ritual the Sunday following their death as a way of paying tribute to that person's life. It doesn't substitute for a memorial service, which they will have later um, next year, but it is our way of acknowledging the person's life and they have died. Diane Taylor, a member of our congregation, was born on March 19th, 1944 in Springfield, Massachusetts. She grew up in Needham, Massachusetts and graduated from Needham High School in 1962. I might add that there's a well-known UU church there in Needham, Mass. She graduated um, from graduate school at Purdue University. That is where she met her partner, Rogers, who was then a doctoral student in industrial psychology. Diane and Raj spent 38 years in Bloomington and they welcomed their sons, Adam in 1972 and Christopher in 1974. Though neither Diane nor Rogers believed in the literal divinity of Jesus, Christmases were always a joyous and special time for them in their household. Diane was a vocal proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment in the mid-1970s, often taking her children with her to demonstrations. And she started attending the Unitarian Church of Bloomington partly because that was a place where she could find other friends and other women to meet and enjoy common interests with. Diane started working for Project Oz, a drug education nonprofit, and went from there into junior and high school education. In 2006, she and Rogers moved to Las Cruces Diane was active in our church. She was an active knitter and spinner. In the fall of 2018, 
she began to have some unexplained falls and also began to notice that her movement in her hand was becoming limited and she couldn't knit anymore. Later in 2019, last year, she was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and was entered into hospice care early in May of 2020. She died just recently on June 25th. The family has not yet planned a memorial service, but hope to have one here in Uni at the Unitarian Church in Las Cruces sometimes in May of 2021. In our tradition, when we have a member who has died, we <coughs> have a, a new child who's joined our congregations. We give the parents a rose that has been dethorned. And then when those children come of youth, we give them, those youth themselves, a rose with thorns to symbolize the thorniness of life. When we have a member who has died, we take the yellow rose of friendship. We take a few petals and put them on a bowl of water, casting these petals upon the waters. And then we light a candle. We do this in memory of Diane Taylor, our beloved member, in honor of a <coughs> universalist life well lived. And we offer our sympathies and deepest expression of condolences to her family in the wake of her death. Amen. And now please join me in our affirmation of covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. And at the UU Church of Boulder, we affirm our covenant with these words. We gather in fellowship to speak truth to each other, to reach out and touch one another, to care with each other, and to seek the truth divine, so be it. These are the doxologies in English and in sp Spanish. From all that dwell below the skies, let songs of hope and faith arise. Let peace, good will on earth be sung through every land by every tongue. De todos bajo el gran sol, su esperanza, fe, amor. Verdad, belles en la canción de cada tierra, cada voz. Good morning and welcome to our continuing virtual worship services for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Las Cruces and this morning for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. My name is John Seeley, and I'm one of your service associates this morning. I am delighted to be with you. Unitarian Universalism has no creed or dogma. We are a covenant-based church, meaning that we agree to live in relationship with each other according 
to the Unitarian Universalist principles in our congregation's covenant of right relations. We embrace diversity in all its forms. Everyone is welcome here. You can learn more about our church at the, at the website uuchurchlc.org. Directly following this service, there will be a 15 minute opportunity to fellowship with one another and the folks from Boulder on a Zoom site. You're welcome to join us. Thank you all for being tuned in with us today. Our next hymn is number 146 in the gray hymnal. Soon the day will arrive. Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear and the children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunder clouds will appear wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me some have dreamed some have died to make a bright tomorrow and our vision remains in our hearts now the torch will be passed with new hope not in sorrow and the promise to make a new start wait and see wait and see what the world there can be if we share if we care you and me wait and see wait and see what the world there can be if we share if we care you and me thank you my friends what a joy it is to be with all of you this morning and to see so many faces out there that I do not know. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Reverend Dana Lightsey. I'm the, uh, what is my title? Acting Lead Minister for a couple of months. And I'm still the Assistant Minister of the Church as well. Um, I invite you to, if you're not already, to click on the button at the top left corner, top right corner, to see the gallery view. Check on gallery view and just toggle through and see all of the amazing faces, all of the amazing people that are joining us this morning. Notice the people that you know and the people that you don't know. And what a joy it is to come together And now I invite you to choose someone that you do not know. Just pick someone that you do not know. As we settle into a meditation and carry them with you in this meditation. I invite you to make sure that you're muted. And as I ring the bell, settle back into your chair and start to focus on your breath. A 
and breathing in. Just notice you are breathing in and breathing out. Notice that you are breathing out with calm and with ease. And recognizing that the air you breathe is the same air around the globe that all beings breathe. And as we come together today across the Zoom waves of the Wi Fi, the internet, let us contemplate that deep interconnectedness. the sacred bond between us as a part of this earth and a part of life. <sighs> feeling the sacred bonds with all humans and especially people of black, indigenous and people of color who are hurting in this present moment and who have been harmed for many hundreds of years The earth and the sun share with us the life force. They are the great sacred source of life for all and each and every one of us. And yet as humans, we have twisted this equality and made it unequal. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a sacred bond through our covenant and through our commitment to acknowledge that our country has been built on the roots of this inequality. Let us take a moment and just acknowledge and connect with that reality and the pain and the suffering that this lie of equality has caused. This is our invitation to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, to connect with the pain and suffering and to commit ourselves to making true equality and justice a truth of this country and to bring the ideals that we claim to have from the very beginning into reality. My friends, look in, and connect with each other and lift each other up in this great covenant, the sacred bond between us as Unitarian Universalists, as human beings, and as people committed to justice, equality, and courageous love Feel your commitment to yourself, to the person from the other community that you do not know, and to all human beings, especially the 
people of color who have suffered. May it be so, for we who believe in freedom cannot rest now or ever until it is true for all of us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you.
Our reflection this morning is my own, and I have entitled it, Starting to Sort It All Out. Freedom from, freedom to, and the UU first principle. Respecting the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I have been buried in an uncomfortable jumble of thoughts and feelings recently. A series of things have made me ponder. COVID-19 and sheltering in place has prompted me to voluntarily surrender some of my freedoms for the public good. George Floyd's murder by policemen and the knee on his neck metaphor Al Sharpton so effectively used to describe the long-standing plight of black Americans disturbed me. The peaceful demonstrations across the country in large cities and small towns, and even our ongoing UU vigil in Las Cruces, welcomed with honks and waves from passers-by, have populated my thinking. All this, especially in the context of the 4th of July, with its very uneven significance for many un Americans, is still jumbling around in my head. To settle the jumble down, my habit is usually to do some pondering, reading, and writing, then do them all over again. It's an ongoing, seemingly never-ending process. The thoughts I'm sharing this morning are the result of what I would call my first draft ponderings. The distillation of this uncomfortable jumble I am experiencing boils down to freedom from, freedom to, and to our UU first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Not exactly new ideas, but thinking about them as much as I am is new for me. In the context of the 4th of July, we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. We declared that we were willing to fight for freedom from British rule. We fought the War of Independence successfully. Then, just over two, 10 years later, some representatives of some of us signed the Constitution of the United States of America. Two years later, some representatives of some of us signed the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was intended to guarantee personal freedoms. In general, that document spelled out Americans' rights in relation to their government, and it guaranteed civil rights and liberties to some individuals, like freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and even the right to bear arms. Basically, these documents included freedom twos. So now we have both freedoms from and freedom to. Pictures of the signatories of these documents reveal not a single woman, black person, or Native American. Basically, they were signed by white men. Any wonder why our Constitution is still a work in progress? why there are 17 more amendments after the first 10, the Bill of Rights, why we fought a civil war, why it took so many years and so much effort for women to gain the right to vote in 1920, why it took until the 1960s and so much civil disobedience for Congress to pass meaningful civil rights legislation, why it took so long for the Supreme Court to declare that anyone could marry whomever they love. I think my point is that our basic laws, our freedom froms and freedom twos, are only the context for people to tap into their hearts and precious values, like our UU first principle, respecting the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And then they must act to stir things up building on their heartfelt values, then they express them through their right to assemble, to protest, to use social media and, to, and the press to advocate for their values in an effort to secure a more perfect union. The beauty of the protesters is that they were black, white, brown, and of all ages. They didn't even have to be UUs to get it. 
eight minutes and 46 seconds on the neck was simply outrageous. Just too much. No one hurt, no inherent worth or dignity for George, for George Floyd. So into the streets they went. Minneapolis to Washington DC to Seattle. They used their freedoms too to express their deeply held values. As Martin Luther, Martin Luther King wrote, let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And as Wendell Berry wrote, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we come to our real work. And that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. Amen, Ashe, and may it be so. John, thank you for that beautiful reflection. I think people will think that you and I really coordinated our words today after they hear my sermon, because okay. we are certainly um, align with each other's thoughts and feelings and reactions to the recent events and our calling to respond to them responsibly as Unitarian Universalists today. I want to begin by thanking um, Reverend Lightsey for inviting me to speak to both congregations this Sunday. Reverend Lightsey and I met back in March in Loveland, Colorado, when we were together at a UU Ministers Association chapter retreat, which we have semi-annually. And uh, we had always doing these retreats, a lot of time for fellowship and to get to know your colleagues, especially those who you don't know. And uh, she and I kind of hit it off. I felt that uh, she and I had a kind of meeting of the souls and the spirits. And I had um, immediate affinity for Dana. In fact, um, she leads this um, Wednesday night children's or family service. And as soon as we had a new RE director here at um, Las Cruces, I invited her to tap in to what Dana was doing. And I think that they have connected on a couple of occasions. So um, I found um, Dana to be a great colleague, um, one who I admire her work. Um, she was serving with um, Eric Postal, who I also knew from um, my time in Texas. I'm a Texan and Eric and I were in the Southwest Conference together where I began my ministry when I served with the Unitarian Church of um, Dallas. So it is indeed a pleasure to be here. She said to me that um, the UU Church of Boulder was interested in hearing from colleagues of color or ministers of color. She called me up. I'm glad she thought about me as a person of color who might have something meaningful to say. And I hope today's uh, message on Let's Get Free indeed inspires um, all of us. Before I start, I do want to give a shout out to my Bride, today is our seventh anniversary, and Tamara, who was the um, <laughs> videographer for the flower ceremony, is sitting here with me. I've We've had seven, um, years. seven years of beautiful marriage and partnership, and um, look forward to many more. So the moment has come, and let's explore the notion of let's get free. On June 11th, 1776, Congress recessed for three weeks. And during this period, the Committee of Five, as they were called, drafted the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson drafted it, Adams and Franklin made changes to it, and Congress reconvened on July 1st of 1776 to ratify it. The preamble states these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. According to the National Archives, these stirring words were designed to convince Americans to put their lives on the line for the cause. 
If you keep reading, you eventually will arrive at the most important words in the document. And I quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, unquote. When the founding fathers of these United States signed the Declaration of Independence, their definition of equal was different than what it has evolved to be. That we've come to take the free part for granted is a result of the Revolutionary War, which followed the signing. That we've come to take the all men are created equal part as a reality has not actually happened. The founders use of the phrase all men apply to white men only, as we heard from John, and they meant white land-owning men. The phrase didn't apply to white women nor any people of color. For this reason, every disenfranchised group fought for their amendment to the Bill of Rights for equal treatment. The 13th to abolish slavery in 1865 the 15th to give black men the franchise in 1870, the 19th for women, 1920, as we heard, the Civil Rights Act for all people of color, 1964, the 26th for those people aged 18, 1971. Each had their movement and protest. Within the movements were other movements, for example, the suffragists didn't include black women. Thus, in 1851, former slave Sojourner Truth delivered her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at the National Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Among the most powerful of black suffragists was the Unitarian and abolitionist Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She later formed the American Woman Suffrage Association with Frederick Douglass. All of these people had one thing in common, the need to be free. That is, rights to engage in the pursuit of happiness unencumbered by the power of others, specifically white men. Free means the liberty to enjoy the independence and opportunities afforded white male landowners without question. It means the right to vote without a poll tax amendment 24, 1962, and without intimidation, without submitting to an intelligence examination, and without fear of racists burning down your house, church, or place of employment. Now we are engaged in another type of disenfranchisement, the pursuit of one's purpose without the threat of police brutality and freedom to report harm committed against you and to be taken seriously. I was watching the Netflix movie, Athlete A, about the sexual assault on American female gymnasts during the Larry Nassar era. Had USA Gymnastics, their host agency, taken the young girls seriously and not been so beholden to the trappings of economics and winning, it is unlikely so many lives would have suffered traumatic injury or so many careers ruined. People chose not to see the damage being done in order to avoid the pain and suffering associated with accountability. A similar dynamic is being perpetuated with the epidemic of police brutality. People in police departments, local governments, state governments, and federal agencies enable de facto segregation by their inability to change cultures that perpetuate disparate treatment against black and brown people. Police unions perpetuate racial oppression by defending policing policies that encourage police officers to stop or detain black and brown people who often end up dead in their custody. When allegations of police brutality arise, people in power say they don't see it. Then nothing has to change. The it here is racial oppression and violence through 
disproportionate use of force. It is not written anywhere that people have to see nor understand racial inequities for them to exist. It is not, nor is it a requ required that people believe there are racial inequities. To the extent that people insist on seeing, understanding, and believing such inequities are real from their perspective, thinking that is required to validate bias and prejudice, white supremacy culture will prevail. I want to say that again, to the extent that people insist on seeing, understanding, and believing such inequities are real from their perspective, thinking that it is required that they understand these things in order to validate bias and prejudice, white supremacy culture will prevail. Three years ago, the UUA created the Commission on Institutional Change because it was clear that our faith has been dominated by white supremacy culture. The Commission discovered this inability to understand and see unconscious racism is prevalent among UUs. How did they know this? Because many have asked this question. Why must we do anti-white supremacy work at the congregational level. They have said this repeatedly that people frequently ask this question because they don't know. And here's the answer. As long as white supremacy culture is the dominant culture, people of color will continue to be harmed. This year, GA was devoted to disrupting the forces of colonialism and white supremacy culture throughout the UUA and its member congregations. The agenda for GA allocated significant time to the commission's report and findings. And I encourage everyone listening or watching to read the report for themselves. This work is long, tedious, and painful. In her sermon for the service of the living tradition two weeks ago at GA to delegates and attendees, the Reverend Danielle de Bona said, we are striving for here, what we're striving for here is covenant and commitment, not comfort. Not comfort, as we heard in our guided meditation. It makes me uncomfortable too to speak these truths, but growing into our calling as a force of love and transformation in the world means we must befriend the discomfort that accompanies change. I heard a story about a woman. She bought a new car loaded with high-tech options. And the first time she drove the car in the rain, she turned a knob she thought would start the windshield wipers. Instead, a message flashed across her desk saying, drive car in 360 degrees. She had no idea what that meant, so she got home and she read the owner's manual. She learned that while trying to turn on the windshield wipers, she had inadvertently turned off the internal compass and the car had lost its sense of direction. To correct the problem, the car had to be driven in a full circle pointed north and then the compass was reset. Each time we gather for worship, my friends, we are resetting our internal compass. We come to be reminded that practicing this faith comes with a level of discomfort. We must get comfortable with discomfort in order to change ourselves and change the world we dream about. I know many people are drawn to Unitarian Universalism because they encounter many so-called like-minded people. But this is not a one-size-fits-all faith. Part of resetting our internal compasses or our individual owner's manuals means acknowledging differences and in, in, in acting accordingly. I believe that we're living in a special time right now. The Bible refers to such periods as kairos or anointed time. And the universe has anointed us with an opportunity to make real systemic change. Like in the year 1776, people are 
putting their lives on the line now for the cause. Many in our society are getting on the bandwagon and we have a bracket of time to change the culture. Speaking of time, I heard about this man who died and went to heaven. St. Peter escorted him down this long hallway filled with thousands of clocks and the hands on the clocks were moving at all different speeds. Peter explained that every time a person, every person has a clock and when they do something wrong, the clock ticks. One clock was barely moving. That was Billy Graham's clock. Another clock was creeping along, Mother Teresa's clock. The man said curiously, can I see my clock? Peter said, yeah, we keep yours in the office and we use it as a fan. <laughs> well, I grew up in the South, in Georgia, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and I spent the majority of my life in Texas and consider myself really a Texan. When you spend your time, your whole life in that culture, you take for granted that some things are normal and will always be with us. Just like a goldfish in a fishbowl that doesn't know its environment is made of water, I didn't realize I was living in a repressive culture. And I'm ashamed that it has taken me years to realize that the statues of Robert E. Lee and other Confederate monuments represent the mistelling of history. Citing the phenomenon known as Zygernick, Lewis Hyde says in his magnificent book titled A Primer for Forgetting, Getting Past the Past, and I quote, win your war, erect a few statues and everyone moves on. It is the battle loss, not the battle won that clings to the mind, end quote. We can't move on, my friends, because those statues represent people who fought for the Confederacy. California Congressman Mike Garcia says, and I quote again, their support for slavery was wrong and calamitous for the country, end quote. I believe those monuments are fake news. They venerate a culture designed to intimidate and dominate people and perpetuate white supremacy culture is all a lie. As Maeve Higgins wrote in her New York Times op-ed titled, Trying to Be One of the Good Ones, and I quote her, one powerful lie that we white people were born into is that white people deserve different, better lives than anyone else, end quote. I argue that that lie is a freedom killer. It kills the hopes and dreams of people constitutionally granted the right to equal treatment and the pursuit of happiness. It's a lie whose time has come to die. As Unitarian Universalists, we're being called by our national leadership to deconstruct this and other lies that put a knee on the neck of freedom throughout our movement and especially in congregations. We must all begin chanting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and doing the work of deconstruction in our congregations. If well done, deconstruction can lead to another reconstruction. We need to reconstruct the culture that enables police brutality. And within Unitarian Universalism, we need to reconstruct a culture that keeps people of color from becoming their best UU selves. Again, I say to you, please go to UUA.org and find the report by the Commission on Institutional Change and educate yourself on this mandate from our President, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and that commission led by Reverend Leslie Takahashi. And until we are all free to be, that is independent and able to live and express ourselves as equals, none of us is free. 
don't kid yourself, none of us is free. We don't need to redefine freedom in this country. We need the collective will to uphold the definition we already have for all Americans. Our founding fathers should be proud of us today that we've evolved and made more inclusive their definitions of freedom and liberty. Their spirit should be saying to us, their political descendants, quote, we did our best to right the wrongs we committed by not meaning all people in our preamble. And they ought to be proud we are finally moving in the direction that takes seriously the right for all people to expect to live safely, fearing not law enforcement. But those spirits won't realize the true meaning of the pursuit of happiness until all of us are truly free. The former Secretary of Defense and the former head of the Boy Scouts and the former head of the Central Intelligence Agency and the great former president of the, Uni of the University of Texas, of the, not te University of Texas, but um, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, my mistake, was speaking about his latest book called The Exercise of Power. And he said that America, as much as we love it, and as much as we admire it, and as much as we believe it is unique in the history of the world and a unique force for good is still flawed. The rest of the world knows we're flawed, but they also know we're about the only country in the world that consistently tries to get better. We know what we believe in and we work every day at trying to make our actions coincide with our beliefs and with what we profess to admire the most in democratic. I believe the same can be said for our Unitarian Universalist faith. We love it, admire it, believe it is unique in the history of religions, is a unique force for good, and it is still flawed. Likewise, we know what we believe in and we work every day at trying to make our actions coincide with our beliefs and with what we profess to admire the most in the spiritual life. I met Joey Witherspoon in a breakout room during GA. And there were six of us talking about the meaning of ministry within Unitarian Universalism in a 45 minute session designed for us to get to know each other aside from the business that was going on during the GA. It was long enough for me to make two lasting connections. Joey was one of those people and he shared his poem or they shared their poem in the web of life with the group. The poem reads, I am mixed and raced in who I love and what I want my body to look like. I am mixed as are my emotions, as are my hopes, as is my role in this world. I am mixed with the world around me, inseparable, integral, entangled. Well, my friends, we are all mixed in the world around us, inseparable, integral and entangled. I'm inseparable, integral and entangled with you and you are inseparable, integral and entangled with me. These two congregations are inseparable and integral and entangled in Unitarian Universalism. Why not make the most of our inseparability, integrity and entanglement by voluntarily giving up privilege, power, and supremacy. Let's make the Declaration of Independence live up to its words. That means making sure we all get free. Amen, Ashe, and may it be so.
Japanese bones that were made long ago. I have some cracks in me. They have been filled with gold. That's what they used back then when they had a bowl. Not hide cracks, it made them shine instead. So now every old scar shows from every time I broke, and anyone's eyes. Can see I'm not what I used to be, but in a collector's mind, all of these jagged lines make me more beautiful and worth a much higher price. Japanese bones I was made long ago I have some cracks you can see see how they shine We try to invite our visitors and friends to consider becoming a member of our community. And we have created what we call a online or virtual membership book with a link here in our virtual order of service. And we invite any visitors or friends who feel sympathetic with our Unitarian Universalist principles, values, and convictions to consider um, signing the book and I or one of our membership team members will be in touch with you to help you walk through the membership process. Thank you. Our closing hem is number 1018 in the teal hymnal. Come and, and go with me. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Where I'm bound. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land. Where I'm bound. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. 
There'll be justice in that land where I'm bound. There'll be singing in that land. There'll be singing in that land. There'll be singing in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be singing in that land. There'll be singing in that land. They'll be singing in that land where I'm bound. Amen. Amen. As we venture into our closing words, Kalani, I want to thank you and thank the congregation of Las Cruces for joining with us today. And, um, what a delightful service and thank you so much for your profound words that um, I think we all resonate with deeply and thank you. Uh, we are going to share closing words by Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu called The Liberation is Costly. Liberation is costly even after the Lord had delivered the Israelites from Egypt they had to travel through the desert. They had to bear the responsibilities and difficulties of freedom. There was starvation and thirst and they kept complaining. They complained that their diet was monotonous. Many of them preferred the days of bondage and the flesh pots of Egypt. We must remember that liberation is costly. It needs unity. We must hold hands and refuse to be divided. We must be ready. Some of us will not see the day of our liberation physically. But those people will have contributed to the struggle. Let us be united. Let us be filled with hope. Let us be those who respect one another. I want to thank also thank Reverend Lightsey for her beautiful collaboration this morning and to Brother Stephen Todd and to John also. Mm -hmm. Of course, our song leader, Ray Vonder Ott, Vonder who has done a fantastic job and who also serves as our one of our board members and is doing a great job there. And of course, we thank all of you from both congregations here in Las Cruces and in Boulder. And we promise to do this together again and continue to work on our freedom. Thank you. And we now extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Hope and change is what you voted for, but looking at you now, I know that you're wishing that your vote did something more to move it forward, hoping that the nation would be freed from the hands of ignorance and greed, but you know the slogan always needed just one more word, hope, struggle, and change, hope, struggle, and change. There's trouble and danger on the road to justice. Gonna keep on hoping, gonna keep my eyes open. And the change will come, the change will come, but it won't be easy. You know that civil rights didn't fall to us the moment those of Park stepped on that bus. So many fought and died for racial justice before and after. And suddenly a ray of hope appears, but only after years and years and years. And only because of blood and sweat and tears.
music, yes, even laughter. Hope, struggle, and change. Hope, struggle, and change. There's trouble and danger on the road to justice. Gonna keep on hoping. Gonna keep my eyes open. And the change will come. The change will come, but it won't be easy. Elizabeth Cady Stanton never saw a woman's right to hope become the law. But women everywhere now know the awesome load she carries. And Stonewall never settled in a fight. There's been a lot of Stonewall since that night. But one more state just recognized the right of people to be married. Hope, struggle, and change. Hope, struggle, and change. There's trouble and danger on the road to justice. Gonna keep on hoping. Gonna keep my eyes open. Change will come, the change will come, but it won't be easy. We gotta hope and cry and work until we die. We gotta plan and fail, spend the night in jail. We gotta really get this, resist, to raise a fist. We gotta try to revolutionize. We gotta bleed and need, suffer guarantee. We gotta sweat, no doubt. Get the boat out, we gotta howl, yell, raise a lot of hell. We gotta educate and organize. any president to make fundamental change that's our mistake we gotta be a giant just awakening from its slumber we know the moral arc of the universe is bending ever better never worse it's almost like a human race rehearsing for its big number hope struggle and change hope struggle and change there's trouble and danger on the road to justice. Gonna keep on hoping, gonna keep my eyes open. And the change will come, the change will come, but it won't be easy. Yeah, the change will come, the change will come, but it won't be free. Oh, the change will come, the change will come from you. changed history. We have defied gravity. The country has said yes to me, to my work, to my relationship, to my family. It means the world. It's actually everything I've ever wanted to feel. Fellas, in the end, I'll say it again. Hope you go and get married. Great. Well, thank you for hosting us in, in uh, your service today and helping us to be a part of your service today. We will do this again and uh, we will host you guys at one of our services. So I look forward to that. We invite each and every one of you. Yeah, it'll be fun. We invite each and every one of you to join us uh, for coffee hour, virtual coffee hour now, and take a little time to get to know one another. Uh, for those of you who have not joined us for this, we have six to seven people in each breakout room.